in between worlds, in between places. It's most uh, difficult is uh, sleeping time. Right? Herself, for instance, which is a frozen head made from my own blood. So it was a way of trying to understand the forces behind something. What do all these artworks and these artists, many of whom are the most successful in the world, have in common? In cybernetic existentialism, I argue that they are all drawing upon the themes and ideas of two distinct yet interrelated fields, the universal science of cybernetics and the philosophy of existentialism. Many people associate cybernetics first and foremost with high technologies, and cyborg artist Stellark, seen here, is for me a quintessential cybernetic existentialist. He is as uncompromising as any existentialist, with an absolute commitment to progressive self-creation and going beyond his limits. Stellark conceives his body as an evolutionary cybernetic system and emphasises that the human condition is not fixed, but a constantly metamorphosing one. If you read existentialism, it says exactly the same thing. One of my book's aims is to draw out these similarities and correspondences. Cybernetics is a philosophy and science of responsive systems, as opposed to purely mechanical ones, and my artistic case studies include non-technological forms of cybernetics, including sociological. Anne Imhoff's Faust is an example, the top prize winner at the 2017 Venice Biennale. Visitors walk around transparent floors. Below and around them, a socio-cybernetic system of interactions and causal feedback loops unfold between humans, dogs and the installation environment. Imhoff's previous work was entitled Angst, that quintessential existentialist theme, and in both works her moody-looking performers are full of it, looking like models from central casting for a 1960s existentialist movie. They're sullen, distracted, alienated. One reviewer called Faust a masterpiece of modern-day angst. The Nasher Prize in 2017 was won by Pierre Huyg. He sounded more cybernetician than artist when describing his installation after A Life Ahead. He spoke of creating evolutionary algorithms and self-organising systems that continually grow, evolve and shift. Within an excavated former ice rink, his systems include geometric panels in the roof that open and close to let in sun, wind or rain. An incubator contains human cancer cells that grow and multiply according to the amount of CO2 they are fed by the breathing of the visitors. We watch real-time representations of the cancer cells splitting and mutating using an augmented reality app. The work is a characteristic example of what I term cybernetic existentialism in contemporary art, where the artist conceives a responsive and evolving cybernetic system in order to express deep existential concerns, in this case around the fragility of both human life and our planet's environment. The originator of information theory, Claude Shannon, created this cybernetic artwork, The Ultimate Machine, in 1952. It performs a classic negative feedback loop and the simplest of cybernetic tasks, responding to an input on with the output off. This zero or one binary is used to equal effect in Martin Creed's work number 227, The Lights Going On and Off. The title tells it all. Within an empty gallery, the lights go on and off every five seconds. Like Shannon's machine, Creed's is a minimalist and Dadoist work but opens up large metaphysical ideas, compressing happiness and anxiety within a single gesture. The fact it won the Turner Prize in the year 2000 is not only indicative of its conceptual panache but equally of its currency. It captured a millennium turn zeitgeist, suddenly reconsidering the significance of being and nothingness. In Jean-Paul Sartre's iconic book, The Existentialist Bible, he argues the importance of our confronting and embracing nothingness and our impending doom, what he calls our being towards death. This should be an urgent wake-up call, says Sartre, to remind us to live our lives meaningfully and authentically and to break rules and assert our absolute individual freedom. Five years later, Norbert Wiener's book Cybernetics gave another startling wake-up call. 
It reminded us of boundary-breaking ways of communication and control and of our similarities between humans and machines. Anish Kapoor's acclaimed dissension vividly conjures existentialism's concerns with nothingness, the abyss and being towards death. A flood of jet-black water disappears down a seemingly bottomless vortex. It brings to mind one of Norbert Wiener's analogies of humans as whirlpools when describing how our body tissues regenerate continually in a constant state of becoming. Becoming is also a central tenet of existentialism. He says, quote, We are whirlpools in a river of ever-flowing water. We are not stuff that abides, but patterns that perpetuate themselves. One of the world's richest living artists, Damien Hirst, also uses cybernetic systems while exploring themes of perpetuation, becoming and nothingness. His being towards death machine a thousand years is a large glass box containing a bloody, severed cow's head. It rots and produces maggots, then flies, and once born they quickly meet their end on an insectocutor. Hearst works like a cybernetician to create an aesthetic world that is thoroughly systematised and rationalised. This is a dynamic, self-regulating system crossing the boundaries between the organic and the machine. It results in an existentialist message, confronting us with a visceral and authentic performance of the brief, absurd, apparently meaningless cycle of life. And Hearst shares the philosophy's didactic viewpoint on this, encouraging us to confront our deaths. He describes this work as positive, energising and awakening. Existentialist philosophy is full of discussions of the uncanny. Its German translation, Unheimlich, is the title of this work that I co-created with Paul Sermon and other collaborators. The cybernetic art pioneer Roy Ascot once famously asked whether there is love in the telematic embrace. This installation suggests the answer is definitely yes. It brings together two female actors in London with conference delegates in the USA. You've got a firm handshake. Where are you? Well, this is a, a road we travel down often. We, we live somewhere up there, yeah. but we're going down there. Perhaps we could go together. Okay. okay. Via the internet, these uncanny interactions span thousands of miles and several time zones. Yet the feeling of co-presence and of occupying the same space is highly defined. The sense of cybernetic touch is something that delights audiences and leads to some moments of real contact and intimacy. The piece explores how the presence of a virtual body in front of us elicits our desire and will for an intimate encounter. It emphasises our increasingly cybernetic ontology, the ever-ephemeral status of the human being and our constant quest for communion with others, what existentialism terms being for others. As Sartre put it, quote, I am for others. The other is revealed to me as the subject for whom I am the object. For cyberneticians and existentialists, the concrete approaches to being are defined by relationships with others, with wider networks and systems in cybernetics and with other human beings in existentialism. I conclude the book with a detailed examination of the similarities between the two fields. It includes this summary chart of their highly complementary themes and terminologies. Their correspondences are striking, but to my knowledge no one has ever traced them before. These range from autopoietic concerns to adapt and evolve, to the radical politics including anarchist convictions of some leading figures in each field. Both movements emerged in the 1940s and by the 1960s had attracted wide public attention and popularity. But by the 1970s, their fames and their flames gradually diminished. Happily, however, both are now experiencing something of a revival that I am glad to be a small part of. <laughs>